Francisco Writers Workshop is it gets together every week without fail and has for, I think we established 11 decades, right? Uh, it's free, people walk in and they follow a few rules, and the result of working together in this room uh, is what we're hearing tonight. Writers helping each other publish their work, and then they end up like the people we're here. So, it's a wonderful thing and it's happening here in San Francisco every week. And then there's Tamim Ansari, who personally guided these little goslings along for quite a few years himself. So, say hello to him when you go by. Next up, Ransom Stevens. Hmm. Well, he's written a number of novels, and let's just say that they mix science and religion, environmentalism and technology, oligarchy and anarchy, that's his choice and his latest, Too Rich to Die, which I think we can all relate to in San Francisco, mm. which is set at the intersection of love and money. Ransom. All right, thank you very much for having me, Olga and Kurt, and the San Francisco Writers Workshop. Um, I learned pretty much everything I know about writing narrative at the workshop. So it was uh, very useful to me. Tonight I'm going to read from the 99% solution. So turn to page 25. <laughs> you didn't bring your copy? <laughs> the setting is September 23rd, 2011, Wall Street, 12.05 p.m. The timer is down to 2 minutes 37 seconds. Officer Justin steps away from Lucy, back to his comrades and the growing turmoil along the barricade. More police advance. Lucy and the two others who were pulled over the barricade have their hands tied behind their backs with plastic cable ties and are being guided to a paddy leg, a bus. All but Lucy caught some of the pepper spray in her eyes. The lull ends with a series of crashing bottles. A large stone lands in the windshield of a police cruiser, shattering a window. Three people in Guy Fawkes masks launch over the barricade, and a torrent of others follow like water flowing over a dam. Eight police officers, including Officer Justin, advance, reconstructing the dam with their clubs. New sounds join the cacophony. A rhythmic thumping of clubs on bodies and the consequent groans. Any protesters who had been standing near that location must now choose between being trampled and crossing the barricade. More police rush in. A woman shrieks. Two batons come down simultaneously, and the shriek becomes a scream, an extended, high-pitched wail of sheer agony. My beagle, Winter, empathizes with his own low-throated moan. The timer now reads 44 seconds. Lucy pulls away from the police officer who had been guiding her to the bus. Perhaps resulting from a faulty cable tie, she has worked her wrists free. She sprints into the fray. Then something happens, something that Fiona would later describe as power, real power, an absolutely brilliant use of power. Upon reaching the fray, Lucy stops. Clubs rise and fall inches from her. She cranks up that voice of hers and says, protect and serve. The timer reads 26 seconds. A coincidence occurs that Velody and I will spend hours analyzing. The constant blare of sirens ceases and the chanting pauses. Lucy's voice is clear to everyone punctuated only by the background beat of a few drums. The officer takes the yellow taser from his belt. Lucy shouts, we are the citizens you should be protecting. It's your duty and you know it. She repeats the last phrase, word by word. It is your duty and you know it. The officer points the taser at her. She says, Remember this moment. Remember the day that you electrocuted an unarmed, innocent woman. Lucy faces the officer with the taser. A small, unarmed, red-haired woman, her hands raised in the universal sign of surrender, facing a giant of a man in a black helmet with complete face shield, wearing a bulletproof vest, 
and holding a bright yellow weapon leveled at Lucy's heart. Several realizations form in my mind. First, it is Officer Justin. Second, I'm certain that he will not pull the trigger. And third, our pivot point predicting algorithms are remarkably accurate. Time does not stop. Time never stops, but people do. The instant, the comparative quiet continues for a full 12 seconds. Lucy says, Officer Justin, please protect me. My phone vibrates in my hand and emits the sound of a beagle's howl, indicating that the timer has reached zero. Officer Justin drops the taser. It dangles from his, from his belt by its yellow cord. He holds his gloved hand out to her, and she reaches for it. Within three hours, this image will become the most shared photograph in the history of humanity. A club comes down from behind her, glancing across the back of her head, making impact with her left shoulder. Lucy falls, her right arm outstretched, hand still held by Officer Justin. She doesn't make a sound. He pulls her forward. The policeman raises his club again, but Justin pulls her out of range. Lucy reuses the momentum provided by Justin and keeps right on going. She sprints past him, parallel to the barricade, to the sidewalk where Fiona Winter and I had observed most of the riot. More sirens approach. Chanting resumes. Save the people. Taze the bankers. But one facet of Lucy's speech endures. The protesters do not resume crossing the barricade, and the police do not resume beating the protesters. Lucy reaches the curb, turns into the crowd, and winds her way through. Fiona, Winter, and I, now with Velodia, run to the sidewalk where we hope to see Lucy emerge on Broadway, but she doesn't. I scan the crowd, but can't find her. Melodia points to a motorcycle speeding down Broadway, and sure enough, a wisp of red hair sticks out of the rider's helmet, trailing in the wind. As we walk away, we each check our phones. A preliminary update of our code indicates that Lucy's action has set humanity on course for what could be quite an adjustment. The when and where is vague. The who is less vague but the how is indecipherable. Thank you very much.